Um, and I'm just going to start by mentioning a couple of the things that you will need for this workshop. Um, so the main things I'd like you to have open before we even get started is I believe you will have installed Visual Studio Code. Um, if you do not have it open already, please do make sure you've got it open, because if you want to follow along with the website creation part of this workshop, then you're going to need that application open. Now, the other things I'm going to recommend you open before we get started is in a browser, um, the place we will actually be starting from when we get started making our website is going to be this wowchme.com forward slash templates. Now, I'm just going to copy that URL into the Zoom chat. So anyone on the Zoom, you will be able to see that in the Zoom chat. Anyone not on the Zoom, um, that's just wowchme.com forward slash templates. So that's going to be the place that we start from uh, essentially to find templates of websites that we can reuse and repurpose. Um, so I'll just wait a moment while you, you navigate there because I understand you might have internet connection to battle with as well. Okay, now if you've got that link open in a tab, the final thing I'm going to ask you to please open before we get started with anything is in a separate tab, you might want to go to github.com and just make sure that you are logged into your account. Um, so we will be, uh, all the websites that we create today will be hosted in a repository um, and that repository will be living on GitHub. Um, so please do also make sure that you are logged in to github.com uh, in a separate browser. And once you are there, so we've got Visual Studio Code open, we've got wowchamy.com forward slash templates open, and we've got GitHub open. I'm actually going to start my presentation then. <laughs> um, Okie dokie. Right. If if uh, if the pace is too, uh, if, if I've gone too quick past anything, then please do just flag to me in Zoom. Uh, but I'm going to assume we've got those three things open now. And I'm going to start uh, with a few slides to get us going. So as I say, today I'm going to be discussing how uh, ways in which we can increase your online visibility as an academic. Um, and first of all, it's important to know why online visibility is important. Um, given that you're attending this workshop, I have a sense that you might already have a feeling of why online visibility is important. Nonetheless, it is useful uh, just to highlight some of the reasons that, that we do usually want to be online. So the first and foremost is, is, is networking, making connections, connecting with other academics. Um, this has been more important over the last few years than ever before, I believe. So uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, the way in which we would usually do networking via in-person conferences, it just wasn't a possibility. Um, so it became more kind of emphasized than ever that we need to be online and making the most of those online uh, communities in which we can connect with like-minded individuals. Um, and this feeds into the second point here of collaboration. Um, so for instance, it might be that we connect with someone who's doing a very similar area of research to ours. Maybe we even think of a study idea and maybe we execute that study idea together. This has actually happened. I have, um, I have papers in, pro in progress with people that I've only ever met through Twitter. Uh, of course, I've, I've met them in uh, the video calls and things like that afterwards. But online visibility has been essential um, to this. You can also use things like Twitter for uh, kind of literature discovery. I call it um, productive procrastination when you feel like you need to scroll something, um, but also at the same time, you want to feel a little bit productive. Um, I find that my for me, my academic Twitter is the place where I fulfill that productive procrastination. I'm doing a social media scroll, but also at the same time, I might come across some useful papers um, in my area. Um, or even useful tools, um, some of which uh, I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate in a moment. So for instance, citing, citation tools, or things like that, or even tools about how to make a website, which is actually how uh, I came across the materials for uh, what we'll cover today. 
The other thing is it's a good opportunity to get feedback on your paper. So you might share a preprint. You might kind of ignite discussion about the, the topic that you're interested in. And it's a good chance to essentially have like your mini lab group meeting, but online and with kind of a broader audience than you might be, uh, be, be used to in your closer knit network. This final point, um, acting as a pseudo CV, this is really more with reference to your website. Um, so once we get into creating your website, this becomes a place where you can, um, you know, document the talks you give, document the, um, the, the papers you publish, write blog posts. It becomes a place where you have an outlet for so much more than just, um, you know, your, your list of papers. And because of this, it really shows your skill set and is a really good landing place for employers to come to when they might be you might be applying for a job and they're scoping out who you are, what your skill set is. Um, and I mean, as well as acting as a pseudo CV, you can put your actual CV on your website as well. So I find this really useful just to have a downloadable PDF from your website. Uh, thinking about this, if anyone goes to my website right now, I probably need to update my CV. So this is a useful, uh, a useful reminder for me as well. So how can we increase our online visibility now we know why it is important? Um, now, the two things I'll be talking about today are, first of all, social media uh, and second of all, a website. Now, of course, there's many branches of social media that we might want to use uh, in order to connect with our community. As I say, the primary one I will be talking about today is Twitter. However, recently, a lot of the academic community have also made the move towards Mastodon, uh, me included. So I do, I, I'm currently kind of navigating both camps. I'm still active on Twitter, but I have my Mastodon handle advertised on my Twitter page. And I'm also kind of posting the same things to Mastodon. Whether I make the full move over to Mastodon is still a commitment that I'm, I'm trying to weigh up in my mind, um, as I'm sure others might be familiar with, uh, with as well which is why I'm going to focus on, on Twitter for now. Um, but just to note, there are other things like LinkedIn and, of course, Instagram and TikTok. I do actually have a my own TikTok as well, uh, although I'm not very good at posting there. Facebook I don't use, but I know others that do. Um, I would flag that in terms of social media, the main difference between Twitter and LinkedIn for me is LinkedIn is really where I would connect with industrial partners. So uh, clients in commercial based clients, um, maybe also teachers. So the school system um, in my role at PsychoPi, we, we reach out to a lot of A-level students, for instance, not A-level students, A-level teachers. Um, and LinkedIn would be the primary place where I find it easier to connect with them. Twitter is really where I've been focusing on connecting with academic, uh, other academics and and also, I'd say I'm a lot more relaxed on Twitter than I am on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm still professional on Twitter, but also I'll occasionally tweet about moaning about something, um, whereas I wouldn't do that on LinkedIn, let's say. OK, so uh, what do I tweet about? As I say, it probably started with me just moaning about things in my PhD, to be honest with you. Um, and it turns out that this was where a lot of other PhD students were also moaning about things. But Moaning makes it sound negative. It also gives you that kind of shared community vibe and that, you know, we're all in this together and we're supporting each other. And um, that was kind of what really stood out to me about Twitter in the first place. Now, I use Twitter more for sharing methods based things. So, for instance, we focus a lot on developing tools for creating cognitive experiments. So I will share a lot of tips on how to create cognitive experiments, questions that people have asked me and, and how you can address them. So that would be kind of where I, I share what I do mostly on Twitter now. So sharing code and things like that as well. And in terms of how to make the most out of the Twitter environment, but I think this does stand uh, for a lot of other platforms as well. The first thing I would say is, is I like to use this as a platform sharing resources. 
So I do share a lot of methods based things that we're developing, but often I'll stumble across a research. For instance, here, um, I stumbled across this connectedpapers.com. I don't know if anyone has ever used connectedpapers.com, uh, but it's really cool. Um, you type in a uh, your kind of citation, and then it will give you this kind of uh, one of these little graphs showing you all of the papers that are connected to that paper, which is really useful starting point for when you are looking to expand your literature search or you're new to a particular topic. Um, and it's also useful to see who is citing your work as well um, so that you can kind of make those connections. So sharing resources and also keeping an eye out for resources as well on Twitter. Um, this might sound like an obvious one, but using rel relevant hashtags and profiles. So, for instance, in my PhD, PhD chat would be what I would tag quite a lot. Um, and academic chatter is probably the most general platform um, to be including in your posts if you want to reach that wider uh, community of academics. Um, often they will reshare those materials that you're sharing. Um, and it's a good way uh, to make connections. Another uh, thing you can do with your tweets is using polls. Uh, so any way of essentially encouraging interaction with your tweets will increase your visibility. Um, so here, for instance, um, I asked a question um, that didn't necessarily get many likes or many tweets, but it did get almost 700 votes. Um, so to me, I would say when you're kind of evaluating how how well, how, what's the reach of this post, Doing things like polls is a really useful way of gaining that information um, as well, and, and also actually gaining the information that you want from the poll itself. Uh, so here, uh, I was trying to figure out how, how are people best learning about software? Was it by, via text, via videos or other? Uh, and it, I, I had an inkling that it would be videos. I was trying to prove a point with my team, so to say, uh, but it turns out it was a lot more balanced um, than I expected. The other thing um, is that when you're sharing your articles on Twitter, um, you might have, I think this this is one that a lot of people are doing now, but using threads. Um, don't use a thread that is, I would say the magic number for me is, is probably about, well, seven or eight um, posts in a thread, anything more than that. And I kind of uh, think people tend to switch off and they think, oh, I'll probably just go and read the full paper myself if it's kind of a thread of 30 posts. Um, but at the same time, you want it to be enough posts to be engaging. Um, also, I'd say a useful metric is how many figures do you have in your article? Um, because for me, when I'm doing a thread, usually I'm wanting to demonstrate one of those figures per um per post to make it really visual make it really engaging um and then i'll use that as kind of a guideline as to how many posts i'm going to do in my thread and the other thing is that when you are in the twitter environment you can pin uh, posts to the top of your page in order to have a longer impact so it won't be that when you first post uh, your your paper well, it might be um, that you get heaps and heaps of interaction. But over time, when people revisit your profile, what's the first thing you want them to see about you? Um, it might be a publication, but it might also be an event you were involved in. It might also be a talk that you gave, a conference. Um, it might just be a question or something that's important to you that you have that you want others to engage with and continue to engage with over time. So I would say being aware of what you're pinning to the top of your profile is super important um, in Twitter. In terms of what Twitter has opened up for me, um, it's an easy icebreaker for so many conferences. You know, you might see someone you think, I think I kind of know them. You just go, I think I know you through Twitter. Um, it's much less awkward, um, I find, or just to, just to approach people in this way. Uh, and that's a nice way to kind of get the conversation started. What has been really lovely has been having the opportunity to be invited to give talks to international lab groups. I've put here most recent was at WashU, but actually technically my most recent is this talk now. Um, so thank you very much uh, for, for the invite to speak as part of this. This was actually all kind of ignited through Twitter, which is, is fantastic. And as I say, papers in progress with people that I've only ever met through Twitter, which is 
a little bit odd, uh, but just goes to show the power of social media beyond um, necessarily just, you know, meeting people at conferences. It, Twitch is the conference that kind of lasts forever. So in terms of what I wish I knew at the start of my Twitter journey, um, there's a few external tools that you can use with things like Twitter, but also with other platforms too. Um, so you can schedule tweets using something like TweetDeck. Um, this might be, so I would use something like TweetDeck if I've had a day where I happen to have found 10 useful resources. I might have found like that connected papers, for example. Um, I think, you know, I want to share all of these tools, but I don't want to share them all at once because I feel like that's going to really annoy people um, because I'll just be kind of spamming their Twitter feed with, with me and my tools. So what I'll do is sometimes I'll use TweetDeck to maybe kind of schedule these um, for maybe next week or a couple of weeks in advance. And this is good as well because it kind of helps take the weight off feeling like you look like you have to be active on social media um, because to kind of build up a following and I say build up a following, I don't have a massive following. I have, I think I have like 2000 and something followers. So I'm not, I'm not Twitter famous uh, at all, but there is sometimes this pressure when you have a social media platform that you feel like you have to be constantly engaged with it. And I think that things like TweetDeck and things that allow scheduling take some of that pressure off because past you has thought about future you in scheduling tweets. The other thing um, is to make a website for your bio, which hopefully is going to be what we get stuck into in a moment. Um, and also the other thing I'll mention is you can always go to analytics.twitter.com. If you love a bit of data, um, which I personally do, analytics.twitter.com will show you kind of uh, which of your tweets were more interesting to people, which uh, yielded the most engagement. Uh, also, how many tweets are you doing over a certain period of time? Um, I personally just like analytics.twitter.com um, because it's it, it just gives me big data um, and I, I like to have a look at it. This other point might sound really obvious, but share your handle. For ages, I felt really, really cringe about sharing my Twitter handle. Um, but if you don't share it, you don't make connections. Um, so do put your Twitter handle on posters, on your talks, um, on anything where you are looking to connect with other like-minded researchers. And last but certainly not least, remember to take Twitter breaks. Um, so sometimes I'll take full digital breaks for a week, you know, while I'm while I'm away. Um, but sometimes I find that for me, I get a little bit distracted by Twitter if I'm looking at it all the time. So I'll just kind of make the conscious effort for me personally to take breaks from Twitter. Also, because otherwise you kind of end up in this world where people might only tweet about the positives of academia, about all the publications that they're getting. And that can sometimes be a little bit uh, disheartening, especially when you might be in a space of, I just got, uh, my paper just got rejected for the third time. Um, I've got some reviews uh, back that are particularly slandering or something like that. Um, and I think that sometimes it's, although actually I'd say now the social media space is becoming much more balanced, but I don't know if that's also part of, who I'm following and connecting with as well um, is that people are kind of more balanced in what they uh, share on social media. Okay, so I've spoken through a little bit of uh, introduction to, to social media and Twitter. And as promised, uh, we're going to kind of spend a bit of time now walking through how to uh, get started making an academic website. Now, a quick disclaimer, I am not a web developer. Um, and I myself am very new to these tools. Um, so, but I think that's kind of hopefully helpful in the perspective of you don't have to be a web developer in order to make yourself a website. Um, now, my apologies for the large number of prerequisites I've emailed you on to install there. Um, if you have got those things installed, that's brilliant. Um, you will be pretty much ready to go. If you have not got those in things installed, then feel free to kick off the installation process, you know, at the start of our talk now, uh, maybe just watch as I walk through the creation of the website. As I say, this whole thing is recorded anyway. So you can come back to this uh, if you want to kind of, you know, press pause on what we're doing as we go through. 
Um, but I'm just going to give a walkthrough of creating an academic website and we'll see how far we get. Hopefully, if you want to follow along, you can also follow along and make your own website. But let's see how we get on. Another disclaimer is that I can take absolutely no credit for this guide that I'm about to walk through. So Dan Quintana made an excellent resource, uh, a non-technical guide on making a personal academic website for free uh, using WowChimmy, which is going to be what we use today. I've made some minor updates to this tutorial because WowChimmy changed uh, to use a new block structure, which is slightly different uh, to what Dan talks through within this guide. Um, however, most of this does come from uh, this particular guide because I think, you know, there's no point reinventing the wheel when someone's already made such a fantastic resource. Now, in terms of what you need, I know you've already had this in your email, but you need a GitHub account. So GitHub's going to be where all of the files are going to live under GitHub version control that make up our website. You want your Netliffy account. So Netliffy is going to be the platform on which we host our website. Uh, and hopefully you'll uh, see that Netliffy has integration with GitHub. So for the large part, these two things we don't always need to interact with separately. Uh, they are quite well integrated. And then finally, you've got Visual Studio Code, which is going to be where you're making all of the edits to the um, website files themselves. Now, setting up the VS Code environment, so Visual Studio Code environment, is actually the bit that um, when I sent you all that second important update email, uh, it can take a little bit longer to set those things up. And I didn't want you necessarily to be sat there 15 minutes watching me install something. Um, so there are two extensions that we install to the Visual Studio Code environment. The first is GitHub pull requests and issues. This is what allows us to connect our files to GitHub uh, to uh, kind of clone the repository um, the first time that we want to kind of pull those files to our local desktop and also then to sync changes back to GitHub as we go through making edits. So that's your first extension. Um, the second extension is this browser preview. Now, browser preview is what's recommended in Dan Quintana's walkthrough. Um, when you try and install this now um, on in Visual Studio Code, you might notice that it says deprecated and it's got a big cross through it. Um, do not worry about that. Just ignore the fact that it's fully crossed out. Um, for the purposes of this workshop, you'll still be able to install it and you will still be able um, to do what you need to do with it. Uh, now, the purpose of browser preview is to uh, provide a live preview of our website while we're creating it in Visual Studio Code. So we know exactly what the website's going to look like before we then push that change to GitHub and essentially make that change live. Now, the uh, now installing these two extensions is actually uh, quite simple. And I'm just going to flag to you where, oops, where you would install those extensions. So in Visual Studio Code, if you haven't already installed those extensions, you just want to click on it's this icon that's kind of uh, far, four squares. One of the squares is coming off it. If you hover over it, it says extensions. And if you select that, you'll be given the option to search in there for the extensions you want. So a reminder that what we want is GitHub pull requests and issues. And we want browser preview as well that says deprecated and cross through. But that is fine for this workshop. So those are the two extensions that you want. When you click on them, they will have the option to install. Um, so mine are already installed, which is why I don't have that option. Um, so you'll want to click on that. Now, beyond the extensions, there was also uh, installing this thing called Hugo Extended via the terminal window. Now, if you are on Mac, that's super duper simple. Um, so in Visual Studio Code, you can open a terminal window by selecting terminal at the top, new terminal. That opens you up a terminal at the bottom of Visual Studio Code, and that would be where you start typing in your installation commands. Now, the reason that I have shared, and I'm just going to here get the link. Oops. Oh, that's fun. Is that going to let me open the link? Yes, it is. Lovely. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to pop this link into Zoom. 
The reason I've chosen to select the link rather than walk you through uh, the installation process in this workshop itself is because the way in which we install those dependencies does depend on your operating system. Um, so rather than just walking them through in one operating system, I thought I'd share that in advance. So once you've opened up yourself a terminal window in Mac, you literally just copy and paste these lines of code into that terminal window one after the other. Now, for me, it did take about 15 minutes for those Hugo extensions to install. So if it does take a while for you, do not worry. Just let it hang. Um, watch along with the edits that I'm going to make to my website here and you can always come back to it. If you are on a Windows operating system, you want to install one more extension uh, in Visual Studio Code. So for you guys, if I go back to my Visual Studio Code, apologies for all of the windows. Let me make this a little larger. So for you Windows folks, when you go to extensions, you'll also want to search for PowerShell, I believe. And that will be at the top. It will show you PowerShell. And what you can then do is you can launch that PowerShell extension and you're then going to copy and paste the installation commands from that installation guides into PowerShell instead. So that's kind of the subtle difference is in Mac, we're going to use Terminal and in Windows, we're going to use PowerShell. Now, the installation process of that is actually far more time consuming um, and can be a little bit more kind of technically demanding than making the website itself, okay? So if you are encountering kind of uh, barriers in, um, in, in that installation process, then please do um, either, either flag me a question here or feel free to drop me an email. Um, what I'm going to do with the interest of time, because it is... We've got 25 minutes left of this session, I believe. Um, I'm going to walk through the next steps you would do in order to, me to make your website. What I'll hopefully do then is uh, we'll finish with enough time um, for you to uh, ask me any questions um, that you might be hitting if you're hitting any bumps your side. Okay, so that's the first thing we need to do is you would need to create, uh, not only install your Sorry, is someone asking a question or did I just get some feedback? I'll pause for a moment. Okay. I don't think there are any questions. In no, the no questions. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> uh, navigating the hybrid setup. Okay, so perfect. So once you've got everything set up, I'll walk you through what you would do in order to make yourself your website. So the place that we will be starting will be actually at that templates. Uh, so wouchami.templates um, that we went to, that we opened up at the beginning of our session. And actually what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to put the slides away because I think it's much more kind of dynamic for me to demonstrate this on um, in my browser itself. Okay. So the first thing you would do is you would start at your templates, wowtree.com forward slash templates. Now here you have a large number of different website formats that you can use uh, to get started. Um, so we are gonna be using this academic resume uh, template and that's what you'll probably see most academics uh, that have used this approach do tend to use. But if you wanna be creative and use something else, uh, maybe you want to use this, actually, this researcher one, which is actually, that looks quite nice. Uh, but I'll, I'll stick to my plan for today of academic resume. Uh, but do have a flick through those templates and see what's available. When you hover over one of those templates, there should be three options. Um, so there's start with academic resume, preview academic resume, or start on GitHub. Uh, we are just going to click start with academic resume. And what that will do is it will launch Netliffy. Um, so Netliffy, remember, is the platform that we're using to host our website. And there will also then be the option to connect that platform, uh, that website template to GitHub. And that is what we want to do. So we're going to connect it to GitHub. 
And before we save and deploy, we're given the option to give a repository name. Now, this is just going to be the name of our repository as it appears in GitHub. So for me, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this, let's call it SIPS Website Workshop. Lovely. And once I've got that, we are going to save that and deploy it. So it's going to take a little, uh, a few moments to deploy. And what it means by deploying is it's essentially making that template live. Um, so once it has successfully deployed, we have our own website. It's just that that website is the template that we have um, taken a copy of from Wouchamy. Um, what you will see when you click deploy is you'll see this deploy log. Um, and hopefully what we will see uh, in a moment is it will say success. And once it says success, that means that we have successfully deployed our first website. Um, what I will just comment on while it's doing that is at the very, very top of this page, you'll see something that probably has kind of a funny, unique name. Like for me, it's Teal Bubbliana. Teal Bub. Nina, I cannot pronounce that. Uh, but sometimes they're kind of really funny, funny names like Curious Banana or something like that. You'll probably notice that you've got um, a, a rather odd name at the top there. That is the random default name that is given to your website. And so the first thing we probably want to do on our, once our website is live is we want to change the name of our website. I'm just going to scroll to the bottom here and check. We've got a successful message. Lovely. Finished processing build request. I believe that means we have a success. Uh, so what we can do then at the top, just to check that that has worked, I'm gonna click preview. And that shows me a preview of what my website currently looks like. So this is just um, the template that we took from Wouchamy. We haven't edited anything on it yet, but that does look pretty much like what we want to use to get started. OK, I'm going to close that template, but what I'm going to do is just move my Zoom controls that, of course, sit directly where I want to use them. Lovely. What I'm going to do also is I'm just going to change the name of my website. So what I can do is inside Netliffy, I'm going to select Site Settings. And in Site Settings, you'll notice on the very first little tile here, there's Site Information and it says Site Name. For me, it says Teal Bubbliana. Um, and I'm going to change the site name. So it might be if it's your academic website, you might want, for example, like I might have Rebecca Hurst or, you know, my name. Um, you might have something else. For me, I'm going to say I'm going to call it SIPS website uh, template. Or I'll just call it SIPS website, actually. Let's save that. Lovely. Once you have changed your website name, you'll notice at the top where it says settings for, it'll say settings for, and then whatever the name of this website is. And underneath, it will have what the URL is for your website. So by default, it's going to be whatever your site name is, .netliffy.app. And that is the free URL or the free domain name that is used for your website. What you can do if you decide you definitely want to, you know, invest some time in developing this website further, you can use Netliffy to purchase yourself your own domain name. Uh, and that guide by Dan Quintana does actually tell you how to do that as well. For instance, I uh, have my own domain name, RebeccaHurst.org. I had to use .org because some nutritionist called Rebecca Hurst already bagseed uh, RebeccaHurst.com. Um, so I'm RebeccaHurst.org. But so if you don't want the .netliffy.app on the end, then you can use Netliffy to update that. Um, it doesn't cost very much to have your own domain name. I think I pay like a pound a year or something really, really cheap like that. Um, something that's definitely worth it to kind of have that place that is is my CV or just a space that I can use as my professional space moving forward, no matter what you go into, even if you move out of academia, you, a website is always going to be useful for online visibility. Until you've had a chance to play more with it, though, I would suggest just stick with your default name here.
which is going to be uh, whatever your username is, .netleffy.app. If you click on that link, it'll launch your website. It will look identical to what you previewed before because uh, we haven't actually made any edits here. OK, so that's a walkthrough of from getting the template from Wowchamy, which we've already done. So I'm now going to actually close that tab, do a bit of housekeeping. So we took that template from Wowchamy. We then copied that to Netliffy, which is our hosting platform. Um, and what that also did at the same time was it made us a GitHub repository, which is where all of the files that create this website live under the hood. Um, and we're, of course, going to want to edit those files. Now, before we move into Visual Studio Code, it's useful just to have a look at, I, I did ask, um, I said, oh, let's also open github.com at the start of our session. So in github.com, uh, if I refresh this page now, there is at the top of your github.com. So this is github.com forward slash your username. If you're not already here, you can always just go github.com and then select from your, uh, your icon in the top right hand corner, your repositories. And here you can see at the very top there, <laughs> You can see, well, you can see a bunch of websites I made in preparation for this workshop, but at the very top is the one that we actually want for this workshop. So SIPs for uh, dash website dot dash workshop or whatever you chose to name your repository. So note that this doesn't correspond to the website URL. This corresponds to the repository name. And then inside there, these are all of the files that make up your website. There are quite a lot of files here. So what I'm going to do for the purpose of this workshop is I'm just going to walk you through the files that are most important to get you started. So that's going to be our final step here is getting ourselves a copy of these files on our local computer and editing those files to our liking. And that's going to be when we move into Visual Studio Code. OK, so what I'm going to do inside Visual Studio Code is, um, first of all, I am just going to I'll st start a new file. So I'm going to say uh, I'll actually start a new new window completely. Here we go. So we're starting from a total fresh. Lovely. OK, now in here, the first thing I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to take a copy of my GitHub files and pull them to my local desktop. Now on the left-hand panel of Visual Studio Code, you've got a few options. And one of those is source control. And if you select that, uh, there should be the option to either open a folder or clone your repository. If this is your first time using Visual Studio Code uh, or your first time using Git, it might be that it prompts you to install Git. Uh, now, I would highly recommend installing Git anyway. It's really useful for lots of things. Um, so if it is prompting you to install Git, you might just want to, uh, to select that option as well. Once Git is installed, you will then see these options. Now, what we're going to do is we are going to clone a repository, which essentially means to take a copy of something that already exists on github.com and create a direct replica of that on our local desktop. So I'm going to click clone repository. And that will prompt me to give the URL for the repository we want to clone. Now, what that means is quite simply, when we were in our browser, what was the URL of that repository when we were looking at those files? OK, so I'm going to take that. I'm going to pop it in here and I'm going to press enter. And that will then ask me, where do you want to save this repository? Um, now, if you are new to Git, I highly recommend making a folder on your documents or something like that called GitHub. I've called mine Becca's GitHub because this isn't actually my computer. I'm borrowing someone else's uh, Mac for this session. And in there, I have a folder for each of the repositories that I have. Um, ironically, each of these repositories so far, the repositories I've made in preparation for this workshop. So I'm going to make a new folder. And I'm going to call it SIPS website and create. And once that's created, I can select that as my repository destination. And what that will do then 
is uh, you might have briefly seen in the bottom right hand corner that it said cloning repository. It was taking a copy of all of those files. And then I am prompted, do I want to open this repository? And I do. So I'm going to click open. Lovely. So once I've opened that repository, I can now see all of the files that previously we could see on GitHub. Um, I can now see them in my Visual Studio code. And actually, I could also see them on, if I went to desktop, oh, someone needs to have a clean up. Here we go. Um, I could also see them in that location where I uh, clone them to as well. So I can access them through my Finder, but I can also access them uh, from Visual Studio Code itself. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to preview this website. We're going to use that extension, one of the extensions we installed. So recall that we installed browser preview. Um, now, I haven't actually told us how we would use that yet. So what we would want to do here is along the left-hand panel, when you've installed browser preview, there's this little tile at the bottom here. Um, that If you hover over, it says browser preview. And if you click on it, Oops, there we go. It will open up. I've now opened up to, I was impatient. I will close, how do I close one of these? There we go. Um, it will open up a little kind of browser window that by default uh, is at visualstudiocode.com, but we're gonna make that be our website. What we need to do before, uh, that is our website, is we need to launch ourselves a, a local server. Uh, and this is where I'm going to use the terminal. So I'll click terminal, new terminal. And here, this is where all of that Hugo extension that we installed becomes relevant. Uh, so Hugo is the extension that's used for creating local web servers. Uh, which is essentially important for web development. It's what allows us to temporarily host um, a website while it is under development. So for me to create that local server, I can type Hugo server. My apologies if that's a little bit small on the screen share. Um, and what that will do is I'll get a number of prompts that will say start building sites. But eventually, I will see at the bottom a message that says something like web server is available at, and it will tell me the address for that web server. Now, if I copy that and then paste it into my browser preview, what that will do is it will show me the live preview of my website here. So this is just how the website is created from these local files rather than how it looks online. So once you've got this preview, you're kind of at that point where you can start editing your files. OK, so we're finally at the point of editing the files and we've only got nine minutes left. But I'm pretty confident that in these nine minutes we can still walk through the important kind of signposts for making the website ours, making it custom. OK. So most of what we want in order to update our website is contained within this folder called content. So if I open that up, I'll see a number of subfolders, um, authors, event, post, project, publication, slides. And what we're going to do, first of all, is we're going to go to authors. And we're going to go to admin. Now, what you'll notice in each one of these uh, folders, there is a markdown file called underscore index.md. Um, now, that markdown file indicates the content of that particular section. So, for example, here, if I was to select index.md uh, on my admin, you can see here I've got my display name, which at the moment is Alice Wu. I might change that to be. Uh, Rebecca Hurst. Ah. Uh, I might also start changing the other various details as well. Um, and as you work down here, you can see the various different sections and how to edit them. So, for instance, the list of interests, 
the education history, um, the list of social media links and so on. So really, I'd suggest you walk through these and these are essentially what you edit. Now, what's really cool is as soon as I save this, so if I just press Command S, if I look back at my preview, that will now have live updated. So now I have my name there, Rebecca Hurst. What I can also do is I can update any of the files, uh, for instance, my profile picture. So I'll notice in this admin section, I have avatar.jpg. Maybe I want to change that. So what I can do is I have downloaded a new avatar uh, from uh, the internet. And if I say, just go to the location where I cloned this and go into the content file, authors, admin, I can replace this JPEG. And you can see that was actually very quick in the background that has now replaced my profile picture. So I can start gradually making edits to my website. And it's very satisfying, I must say, it is very, very satisfying. Um, one other thing that I think I wanna do before syncing these changes to my live website is, at the moment, my website starts with this big section that says Hugo Academic Theme. And I actually want it to start at my at my about me section. Um, so what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna fold away that admin section and fold away authors. And you'll notice there is an index markdown file within the content folder itself. So this is one layer above the hierarchy on uh, as opposed to where my author's information was. And if I select that, you can see that here, this has several what we call blocks. And this is what is different from Dan Quintana's original walkthrough. So Wouchimi has changed a little bit in terms of how it works under the hood, but I actually think it is more intuitive. Um, so within that content and then index MD section, um, there's a list of sections. And here there are a number of blocks. So the first block has the name hero, then if I scroll down, I'll see a block about of my biography section, then a block of my skills, a block of my experience. And this essentially makes up what's each one of those sections or those blocks on that landing page of your website. So what I'm going to do is I'm essentially just going to delete this whole first block, this hero block, because I actually just want to go straight onto my about me section. So I'm going to delete that and I'm going to save it. And then what I can see in the background here is if I go back to my browser, now the first thing at the top of my page is my about me section. And I would say being aware of that, that content markdown file as well is really important because for instance, if you want to change your list of skills, this is where we change our list of skills. Um, for instance, I'm not sure if everyone here is into photography. Uh, it might be that we want to change that one a little bit. We've probably got a fair few people interested in R and statistics. Um, but here is where we essentially edit that whole first landing page. OK, now I'm aware that I'm pretty much going to uh, need to wrap up. So what we've done is we've got those local files. We have made some edits, very, very simple edits. Uh, but I think that really all you need to know to get you started is how to make the simple edits and navigate the space. So the final step is how do we make these edits live on our website? So that's where this GitHub, um, we're going to go back to our source control section, which if you'll recall, the source control section is what we use to clone the repository at the beginning of um, this part of our session. Now here, what we're gonna be asked to do is we're gonna be asked to stage whatever changes we want to actually push onto our live website. And we can stage either just one of those changes by selecting the little plus icon for that thing. And it will move it into a section called stage changes. So for instance, if I only wanna change the JPEG, uh, for my avatar, 
or I can stage all the changes by highlighting stage all next to changes. And there I have all of the changes that I've made are now ready to be lined up, to be pushed or committed to GitHub. So what I can do now is I'm just gonna add myself a little message. I'm gonna say change profile pick uh, and name. Also, I think I changed, I removed the hero section. So remove hero. And once I've done that, I can click commit and sync those changes. I will be prompted that that's going to both pull any changes that already exist in GitHub to my local machine and push any changes that I've made uh, on to uh, the web. So I'm going to click OK because I'm happy with that. And then our final step is going to be checking, did it work? Did does our website now look more like what we actually want it to look like? The moment of truth, nothing like one minute to uh, to see, did it actually work? We will find out. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is, first of all, actually, so I've opened my browser and in my GitHub, I can see if I refresh that page, that the most recent commit message here is change profile pick name and remove hero. So I know that those changes that I just pushed to GitHub have worked. The question is, does my website look any different? So I'm going to go to Netlify. I'm going to go to that, uh, go to my URL for my website. And there we go. Now my website looks a little bit more like what we wanted um, based on the edits that we've made. So thank you so much for your time today in, in this kind of quick walkthrough of online visibility.